What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Generation Orange. I'm your host, Mark Segovia, alongside my co-host with a scratchy throat, Sean Ringrose. What's going on, Sean? Uh, you said a scratchy throat, trying not to uh, talk too, too terribly much, which everybody knows is very difficult for me. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I, I guess I have to consider myself lucky the fact that I, I don't not really... I don't really deal too much with allergies and things of that nature. So, you know, I know the whole pollen and grass and, and all that stuff going on right now, especially with this weather change. I was hitting a lot of people difficultly. So, you know, if you're one of those people that, you know, have a hard time with allergies, guys, you know, just, you know, get your Claritin on, on, on standby, you know, and just, you know, relax and try to enjoy the show. But, um, you know, obviously last week we didn't have a show, you know, work issues, personal issues, all types of issues so you know we're here back you know two uh, weeks after uh weeks after having our well two weeks after nestor and john had the little rocket league uh episode going on so that, that was a little bit of a different look from the normal um but oh <laughs> uh houston dynamo po podcast says sean the hat is dope uh georgie out there cutting his grass you know he's i guess you know he's a pollinator so, you know, shout out to Georgie over there. Uh, we'll talk about we'll talk a little bit with him, you know, um, going back a little bit back and forth on the search discord about uh, Mateo Bahamich, which we'll bring up here in a little bit. But uh, but yeah, Sean, I mean, um, what are your thoughts, man? I mean, let's start off with the poll of the day from the one that we asked uh, here earlier. when We found out we're going to we we're, were green lighted for a show today. And uh, the poll question of the day was. With all the new additions, players coming back, or the players from coming back from last season, which player needs to have a great season for the Dynamo to be good this year? And my options that I put on there were Mateo Bahamich, uh, Tim Parker, Darwin Quintero, which was last year's MVP, and I put uh, put a section there other to write in the comments. Obviously, you know, just, you know, obviously uh, there's a whole batch of players on the squad, and you know, we want to make sure that if there's somebody else out there with a different, you know, opinion about it, we wanted to hear about it. But with 41% uh, of the vote, Mateo Bahamic uh, wins this um, in second place, Tim Parker, which I could understand why Tim Parker came in second place as well. And then obviously third place, our last last year's MVP, Darwin Quintero. Um, before we get to why, uh, but before we get to Bahamic and all that stuff, other players that were noted in the comments was um, at Sidil Stam said Corona because the midfield needs – Needs to possess, supply, creative solutions, score, and press, and tap system. He might be the only Dynamo midfielder to do all four. Um, you know, he he has a point there. I mean, you know, Corona was brought in to kind of bring in uh, to bring in balance in the midfield to kind of be able to play that number eight role and six, and taps four three three, which kind of plays with two eights and a six instead of uh, two. A two six and ten or whatever um thoughts on that sean on corona i uh i definitely uh, agree in the general sense corona needs to have a good season um you know it, it's it's his opportunity to show why the team was willing to uh you know to to uh, over you know to bid over what austin were trying to do basically um, and I, I saw somebody, and it might have been actually the tweet you were just talking about, but I, I saw somebody talking about it. Um, and, you know, and they mentioned that the things that are we need in midfield right now are the things that Corona does specifically well. Um, and I, I don't disagree with that. Uh, so, you know, I could see Corona being high on the list, but, you know, me personally, you know, I've got somebody else in mind, uh, you know, that, that I think belongs at the top of that list, but we'll get to that here in a second. Continue. So, you know, uh, and, 
you know, we were talking offline before the show started. You know, obviously, Bahamich was uh, the, the winner here of the poll for today's question. And the reason I, I posted this question, because on uh, MLSsoccer.com, there was an article that was posted that I saw that I saw that Matt Doyle uh, wrote, you know, our favorite. Um, and um, he basically was asking, you know, what who was the most important player for each team, you know, you know, for the season. And oddly enough, Mateo Bahamas was the was the the player that he picked. And let me read what he said real quick on the, from the article from MLSsoccer.com. Uh, Houston Dynamo FC, Mateo Bahamich. There aren't a lot of wingers that make the list like these, but there aren't a lot of teams that fall apart as completely as Houston did after Albert Leafs was sold this season. He had four goals, three assists, and 377 minutes, and the Dynamo were three, one, and two with 14 goals scored in at least six appearances in 2020. And their other 17 games, they were one, nine, and seven with just 16 goals scored. Obviously, that was just that was about more than just at least his departure. Holy hell, did at least departure play an outside role in the, the death spiral? Bahamich, who they paid seven figures for to get him from Instituto and in Argentine second tier, is supposed to be a direct replacement. No pressure, kid. What are your thoughts on 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 on, on that, Sean? You know, um, I'll, I'll give you mine afterwards. But um, you know, kind of a big, you know, kind of a big weight to put on on the kid barely coming in. You know, obviously he's still trying to acclimated himself with the team you know I, I know we purchased him the second half of last season but you know obviously he ne- he never suited up and he stayed we loaned him back to institutional to get game time matches and things of that nature but um i mean you know I, you said you had somebody else in mind but is, is mateo bahamish really that bad of a choice to pick if he you know as an important player for the dynamo for this season i'm gonna say no um and and I, I think a lot of it has to do with um, you, you kind of hinted at it, putting unfair expectations on a player that um, while we paid, you know, for us, we paid a decent amount of money for him. And then as a result of that, he was pretty hyped up. I, I think, you know, we look back at historically the players we've brought in and even at least the first, you know, first few months he was here, he wasn't lighting it up. Um, You know, there's an acclimation period to MLS in general. Uh, And we're not talking about a player coming in from the Argentine first division or the Uruguayan first division or Brazilian first division. We're talking about a player coming in from the Argentine second division. Uh, And it's just a lot to put on a player like that. I think that uh, what the Dynamo did in signing Bahamic was they were looking towards the future, not the immediate replacement for Albert Elise. I think their attempt to replace Elise begins and ends right now with Fafa Pico. They're not intending to fully replace Elise with Fafa, but it's the, we're going to draw some attention away from Quintero by having Fafa on the pitch and rotating out Fafa with memo or uh, other winger oper- you know, options like a Tyler Pasher. Um, you know, I, I think that's the intent. So, no, I don't think Bahamich is the guy that, that is most important in terms of this season as a player. I, I think there's a a vision from MLS that they want that to be the case because he's a young, you know, a young South American player, and that always brings eyeballs. But I just don't think the Dynamo expect him uh, to be that player out of the gate. I think they hope that he grows into that in two to three seasons, but not this first season. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I can't disagree with you with that with that uh, analysis of of, of Bahamic. You know, obviously, I think that the reason they got Fafa, players like Fafa, the reason they they brought back and 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 made the the loan deal for Lasseter uh, permanent was the fact that you know to give him some some time to grow. You know, um, obviously, you know, I expect those two to be starters uh, or to be first off the bench, whatever, before Bahamic. You know, unless unless Bahamish just shows out some, you know, this, this next couple of preseason games or whatever. But, but you know, but like I said, I, I'm not opposed to him being, you know, a show out star. Obviously, I don't think nobody is. You know, if if he comes out here guns blazing as a young, you know, Argentine player, or, or I don't know if he, I don't know if he's falling under that U20 rule that came out from the new CBA. Uh, but if he is and, he, and he's out here, you know, doing doing the deal and doing and producing. And that's great, you know, and 
you know, obviously Tab wants a younger team, a more athletic team, a more versatile team. But, you know, obviously, you know, Tab knows that he can't just thrust somebody into MLS like that. And that's why uh, acquisitions like Fafa and um, and sign, and making uh, the loan deal for Lasseter permanent was, I think, essential to the fact that, you know, you want to give Bahamas some time to, to you know, kind of acclimate himself to the MLS culture, to America, to a new country, to new teammates, things of that nature. So, but, I mean, we'll see, man. I, I, I'm excited to see him play regardless of we'll see what happens with him. Um, I don't, if, like I said, I don't, I don't really expect him to start start playing right off the bat. That's why I think it's important for for the Dino to start off really well to to qualify for those U.S. Open Cup spots, so that way you do play him in those games and those lesser games or whatever, or quote unquote lesser games, um, you know. But it's it's going to be important for for Dynamo to to have a, a quick start. But yeah, man, uh, I was surprised to like you like you were that Bahamas was the pick. But I think the fact was it's just out of out of you know. As a fan and, and seeing what the other teams are doing in MLS, you know, when they're bringing in young, talented players, South American players, like, you know, like LAFC with Diego Rossi, like, um, like, like, um, Atlanta United did with Almarone and, and things of that nature. They sign these players, maybe not for, they're, they're for cheap, I mean, but, you know, but still, and they come out and hit the gates running and they produce right off the bat. And I know as a Dynamo fan, but the supporter were like, and when when do we when do we get our Diego Rossi? When do we get our Miguel Moron? When do we get our Freddie Montero? When do we get our you know ex player? You know, so um, yeah, I, I think that's the mo- I think that's the reason why Polly why he got the the majority of the votes in this poll. But you said you had somebody in mind who would be most important, man. Who do you, who who do you have? Who your I, thoughts is important. <laughs> yeah, it it is similar to the Joe Corona um, idea. And, and it's really, look, the, the one position that we've said for, for years now that has been lacking is, is, you know, center back as a leader. Um, and the anticipation is that's going to be Tim Parker. I mean, I don't think there's any question that that's who that is. that's coming in. And, you know, if he does not come out and have a great start to the season, he's already put a lot of pressure on himself. So he's got to rise to that pressure as well. But, you know, the team needs to be stronger defensively and it's going to start with him. And so, yeah, that's the guy that has to have a good season. If you want to, if you really want to have a, a good season as, you know, as a, as a club, as a team. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously I know you, you got love for Tim Parker. I know, I know you see spoken highly about him in, in uh, past shows. And, and I mean, you know, obviously the whole thing with the dynamo has been, you know, trying to find that anchor in the back and that leader. And, you know, from, from everything that I'm seeing and reading and, and and listening to, you know, he's he's not afraid to be vocal. He's out there, you know, trying to be uh, a vocal leader. But, you know, obviously being a vocal leader one is one thing and then showing it on the pitch is another. Um, you know, like I said, I'm not opposed to paying the full amount of accolation money that we owe Red Bulls because that means that he did an awesome job for us. You know, and he became a top notch MLS defender, which is what we're which we've been lacking for forever. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's, 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 a, it's a, I think it's a very important position. I think Tim Parker is someone that does need to show out really well for the Dynamo as well. Um, I think that's, and that's the reason why I think he came out in second place as well. I thought, honestly, from the get-go, I thought he would have got the guy, he would have been the one with the most votes. But, um, yeah, man, Tim Parker, I think he's really important to the success and the, well, actually the immediate, the immediate success for the Dynamo because, Let's not kid ourselves, and I think Sean, you you would be on the same boat with me, and I think the guys here in the chat would be as with me as well. Um, Dynamo aren't looking for a, for a three to four year plan. They they want to make the playoffs this season. Um, the way the playoff system is set up, I mean, it's it, it's not that hard to make the playoffs. So the making the playoffs should be it should be the goal for this season, really. And you know, and then obviously what whatever happens in the playoffs happens in the playoffs, but because of how easy it is to make the playoffs and how many teams qualify for the playoffs in this league. I think it's what 16 out of the 23 teams that we have currently. I mean, to, to be one of those seven teams that we don't make it m- must mean that you just really, you just really sucked or you just lost, like you lost your, your good players, like to, to injury a la Atlanta United from last season, you know? 
Um, but yeah, man, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a make or break season. You know, it's one of those seasons where <laughs> George playoffs, what is that? Man, I know. I'm tr- trust me. I, I think we're all starting to get to like that point. But let's hope that playoffs come back soon. Hopefully this season. You know, cross fingers. But Sean, I mean, any thoughts before we move on to the next topic? You know, there was something as we were discussing <laughs> that uh, discussing Muhammad earlier that you brought up that I actually thought would be great for discussing, which is. Um, you know, yeah, you brought ahead. up uh, the comparison to, and the reason why you think. Actually, I'm going to ask you this question: Why do you think Muhammad is rated so high, or is the guy that was pegged as the player that's most important um, by so many Dynamo fans that follow, you know, us on Twitter, but also by uh, by the writer um, in particular? I'm, I'm curious because you brought it up, and I want you to bring it up again uh, okay. on the show here. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously. You know, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I know that I knew anything about Mateo, Mateo Bahamut, you know, prior to the Dynamo being rumored to go, going after this player, you know. Um, but, you know, from what I've seen of him, you know, and from, I mean, obviously, you know, highlight videos, everybody looks good on highlight videos. That's, that's why they're highlight videos. Um, but, but I just, I just, I just need that, that, that hope because, you know, like I mentioned prior, you know, we're, I think Dynamo fans are ready to get their hands on their version of uh, Diego Rossi, um, Miggy Almaron, you know, Freddy Montero, things of a player of that of that nature. Um, you know, and if if it so happens to be him, this kid, that's awesome, you know. And plus for the amount that you bought him for, you know, it's not it's not only not only is he producing for you on, on the pitch, because if he's doing anything close to what those guys I just mentioned is is doing, then that means he's having a great, you know. A great season in MLS, um, but you know, obviously, it's a lot of pressure to put on a kid. You know, you don't just expect to pick a diamond out of the rough. I mean, like I said, the scout, the scouting, the scouting systems out there for not only MLS but for like all foreign countries, foreign clubs. I'm sorry, looking for diamonds in the rough. There, everybody's looking out there. Everybody's out there looking for cheap, cheap talent that can that can come up and. And make themselves something, you know. That's why you you hear a lot of stories about players like you know that got signed for less than a million dollars, and then a year later they're worth you know twenty, thirty million dollars, you know, in the transfer market. Uh, so I think as a Dino fan, I, I, when is when is when is our time going to come? When are we going to find that diamond in the rough, you know? And um, that's that's the reason why I'm a little bit more optimistic, and I'm trying to be a little bit more optimistic towards Bahamich. Um, just for the simple fact that he, we haven't seen him, you know? I mean, I, I've seen Fafa, I've seen Lasseter, I've seen Christian, I've seen Darwin, I've seen everybody else on his team. I haven't seen Mateo, you know? No, but nobody here aside from the highlights that, that they've shown us in a couple of games that, you know, they streamed or whatever, have, have actually seen this kid play, you know? Um, you know, so it's 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 the excitement of the unknown that I have. Yeah, uh, you say nobody. I I do feel like uh, humorously enough, uh, George uh, has uh, watched some of the uh, Argentine match Argentine Ar- matches from the Argentine league, uh, the second division matches, uh, to try to scout them a little bit. I'm probably the only person who's taken the real time to do that. Uh, outside of say like a Matt Jordan or a Nick Calva, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do think George has a realistic opinion when it comes to that, but um, you know, you brought up, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. See, uh, you brought up, a, a, I think I kind of zoned out cause everybody, Oh no, no, no. Okay. Yeah. You did bring it up cause it wouldn't have been in a chat. Otherwise you brought up Diogo Rossi and I want to talk about Diogo Rossi for a second. Cause um, you know, when he came into, uh, into LAFC, um, you know, the league was a little different at that point, right? It was building to this change, um, to this shift to becoming a more selling league. Uh, but he was brought in for, you know, value wise, roughly 2 million. Um, that's how much transfer fee was. It was a little over 2 million. Um, so still, you know, still around the same as what we paid for Bahamut. So I think we were at one and a half, two and a half, somewhere right around there. Uh, the difference being, uh, in my opinion, is that you look at where Rossi was coming from, from the team that he was coming from, from the system that he came from, 
uh, a much more MLS ready talent. Uh, Bahamic was is being brought in uh, as as a younger player than Rossi uh, from when Rossi came into the league. Um, and, and and to be fair, analysts and pundits knew about Diego Rossi before he was brought here uh, or brought into LAFC. Um, no, nobody nobody knows and knew uh, about Mateo Mohamed really before he was brought up in conversations, um, you know, as rumors and things like that. Uh, it was definitely not a player that I could have said the name to you and you'd be like, oh, man, yeah, that's the player. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> George says we paid $1.3 million too much. Uh, probably not wrong necessarily. But the reason I wanted to kind of talk about Diego Rossi for a second is there was an article uh, that I actually happened to find from Transfer Market uh, that talks about the players that had the largest increases in market value year over year. Um, and no surprise, the player that had the highest increase was uh, Lucas Zellerion, of course, from uh, Columbus because of the success that Columbus had last year. Uh, he was signed for basically or transferred for roughly $6 million, or sorry, $5.5 5, uh, and now he's valued right around $11 million. Um, and so... Uh, you know, that's a pretty tremendous jump uh, for Zeller Ion, um, you know, considering and, and they're still going to be in a position to be able to, you know, make money when they do prepare to sell him off. Um, you know, Alejandro uh, Pozuelo, uh, you know, he is uh, he's worth 13.2 million uh, with TFC. And I don't think there's any doubt that he's worth every bit of that you know, transfer fee uh, or transfer value, um, you know, in his original market value increased over the year by 50% from 8.8 .8 to 13.2. I mean, that's, that's a pretty substantial increase for a single player. Uh, and then of course, Diego Rossi. Now he's up to 22 million, uh, market value, uh, which is about 26.3% from his value last season, which was 13.2. The reason I bring this up specifically, uh, is you look at those, those increases. Um, and, and I posted this in a, in a different discord earlier, uh, last week, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, va the value of, of an asset player team, you know, whatever you want to put it as the, the value of that asset is whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. Um, you know, we were willing to pay what we paid for Bahamich, which means his value is what we paid essentially. Now, what is someone else willing to pay? That's what his market value is, is what somebody else is willing to pay for him. Um, so, so I, I, I always harp about this. Because I think we sometimes get too stuck up on, oh, well, there's these, you know, $22 million and he's only valued at 2.5 or whatever it is. When in reality, there's teams out there that might be willing to pay three, four, or five million dollars for the player. And that means we made three and a half million, roughly, give or take. Um, I'm not saying that he's going to be transferred out or anything like that right away, but there's that exists. And because he was brought in for such a low price point, any improvement he makes this season increases his market value tremendously year over year. And so two to three seasons is not unheard of if he has a good second or a good third season uh, for him to jump to five or six million as a transfer out. And again, you're making three times what you paid. Even Diego Rossi is not worth three times what he was paid to bring in. Uh, well, actually he is. He's 10 times what he was paid to be brought in, but he's a different player, right? He's one, one player in MLS uh, you know, most of the time you're looking to transfer out for a couple million more than you paid. Uh, you know, getting two to three times more than what you paid is absurd in MLS. Uh, th well, thank you. I I didn't take economics, but I have friends that did, <laughs> and I tend to study group with them. So, but yeah, I mean, I mean, it's kind of like the situation with Brian Rodriguez with LAFC. You know, he's highly touted. That, you know, obviously a full time Ur Uruguayan, you know, uh, player, but. but and a lot of people rate him a lot higher than Diego Rossi, and that's why he was able to, you know, get that 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 little bit of a that move to the second division in La Liga or whatever. But there was rumors of him going to Sierra or whatever. So I mean, you know, obviously whatever happens with that, I know LAFC are probably gonna make a little bit of a profit off of that player. But uh, but yeah, man, like I said, I mean, it's just one of those things where obviously you obviously I understand the transfer market. You know, you are worth whatever whoever else is willing to play, pay, you know, and who knows, you know, it can be a situation where, like you said, Hey, Mateo does really well, does okay. The season and next season, he gets his opportunity. He starts and then he, let's say he does really well. And let's say, you know, obviously a club like Sunderland 
was the other club who was who was scouting him. By that time, who knows? Maybe they're knocking on the door to get back to the Premier League, and they're looking for you know obviously still a little bit of a, a cheap talent. And they and they they remember scouting the kid, and the kid is doing well in MLS. So let's bring him on for seven, eight, nine million. You know, yeah, you know, obviously I understand that that um uh, that option. And we lost Mark, so no. uh, oh, oh, Mark is half here. Nope, he's gone. That's my guess. Uh, I mean, to to his point, you know, uh, Bahamut has been brought in. There's hype around him, so it, it is important that he does perform when the time comes. But you know, again, with <laughs> Mister, uh, yeah, yeah, I would almost say I, we should just mute him for the time until he gets back. Uh, you know, oh, but... but yeah, uh huh, uh huh. Okay, yeah, he's gone. He's got to be gone, right? Right. I'm not the only one. Uh, but I also wanted to bring up the flip side of that, which is uh, <laughs> I he's made some pretty funny faces when he's frozen before, so uh, it's probably good that at least it's a decent one. Uh, you know, but going back to Rossi, uh, you know, there's a there's a player in L.A., not not for LAFC, of course, but there's a player in L.A. and L.A. Galaxy that, you know, absolutely overpaid for. Uh, Chicharito, you paid $11 million for his L.A. Galaxy, and now he's... Actually, I think they paid more than eight, $11 million for him. Uh, now his market value is two. I mean, you know, and it's a situation with, of course, Chicharito where you were never intending to sell him on because of his age. Uh, you know, but Gonzalo Higuain, you know, I mean, another player that, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely have to overpay to get that caliber of player. And then they come into MLS and that market value is gone. You get nothing in return for it unless you get an MLS cup and Miami didn't LA galaxy didn't, what do they have? What do those teams have to show for, for what they brought in, you know, what they paid for to bring in those players. I mean, you could say marketing dollars. I'm not sure that's true. LA galaxy struggled with attendance throughout the season. Uh, even when they opened the stadium back up, you know, for, you know, 20% uh, attendance. It wasn't like they were selling out their 20% attendance. Um, Chicharito is not, <laughs> has not endeared himself to the fans, which is no surprise. You know, we talked about it repeatedly on the show that, you know, Chicharito was going to be one of those players that was kind of a hit or miss type player. Welcome back, Mark. Um, hey, yeah. Uh, you know, but it's just, uh, <laughs> sorry. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I bring up those two players specifically because they were the two value- players that lost the most value. Now, Iguain is no surprise because of his age, uh, and Chicharito is no surprise because of a he's been piss poor on the pitch, but also because of his age. Um, you, you know, but it, it's just there are young players in the league that are worth as much as Bahamich, roughly give or take, that have been in the league, or they came from USL and they've worked their way to that point. So, you know, is it is it one of those situations with Mohamed where, you know, in two seasons, if he's not shown, you know, and, and George, I'm going to pose this to you because you've got you've had probably the most time to research him or have spent the most time researching him. Is he a player that in two to three seasons, if he's not cracked the starting lineup and he's not showing, um, you know, similar to what when my in my opinion was. Um, you know, if he's not showing that he's got that capability, is that a player you cut ties with, you know, even though you paid, you know, more than you probably should have paid? I mean, well, before, you know, George answers that question, you know, like, you know, the thing is like, obviously I think we're putting a lot of pressure on this kid, you know, um, or right off the bat, you know, you know, obviously we like, if we compare him to like with Elise when he first came in, we didn't, I don't think we've had that much pressure for Elise. I don't think we expected that much out of Elise, you know, from the get go. That's why when he, uh, when he had his ascendance and he became the player that he became, you know, it was just kind of like, oh, it kind of took us for a surprise a little bit because I remember, you know, I think Kyoto was the better player of the two from the get go because he came out guns blazing, um, you know, and obviously, uh, Bahamut is not, uh, you know, unfortunately, he, like I said, he's he's the one player that we haven't seen, you know. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a disadvantage for him because if if he would have came in with another player that we haven't seen, you know, then we could be, you know, like oh well, we don't know what to expect or is there this much pressure for this kid, you know, or as opposed to this kid, you know, because I don't, I don't, if I remember correctly, when I don't think Elise even started the first game or did he? 
I know Kyoto did because I remember him. I remember the goal, him scoring the goals. But uh, but I only remember if at least started the first games under he first came into the Dynamo. I, I don't believe Elise did. I think there were three, four, or five matches, something of that number, before he actually integrated into the lineup. Uh, he got minutes, but I think they were sub minutes, you know, right out of the gate. Yeah, for sure. So, but um, I know we spent a, a little bit of more time than what we expected on uh, Hamid. You know, I know you want to talk about a little bit about the preseason and and uh, the guys what they're doing right now, and especially a certain player. Uh, Maxi Oriti, who right now is, from my understanding, from what I see on social media, is tearing it up and scoring goals left and right uh, during these preseason games, which is great to see. Obviously, you know, obviously it's between him and, and Christian for that number nine spot. And uh, we're trying to make sure that, you know, whoever we decide to put in that spot actually does a, does a job for us and scores goals, man, because we need goals scored, you know, obviously with the with the absence of Letting uh, at least go and I uh, will transfer in Elise and Mauro, uh, our top two goal scorers for the last three or four years. Um, it's going to be on Oxy and, and Christian's shoulders to go out there and lead the charge as far as scoring goals as it goes. So, what are your thoughts on Maxi? I have said it, I said it actually on the uh, Rocket League you know, uh, stream that, uh, my opinion on Rudy is he's going to be by the, by the end of the season. And it feels almost like he might be this way to start the season. He's going to be the starter. Uh, and you know, I said, I wouldn't be surprised if he got anywhere from, you know, five to seven goals in the season. I, I'm, I'm doubling that. I think the guy could easily get 10 to 15 goals in the season, the way he's playing right now. Now, granted it's against USL competition, but you know, he's got a, He's he's in a system that favors his capabilities and favors his style of play. And if you look at the pictures or the videos of him, he he is very fit. He's ready, um, you know, for the season. And I think there's that natural partnership uh, that already exists with, with him and Fafa because they played together in in uh, Frisco for a season. Uh, you know, I think there's. Um, you know, there's a building, um, you know, comfort level, uh, with him on the pitch, uh, with him on the pitch with, uh, um, God, who else played with my blanking right now, uh, with him and Pasher, uh, actually, I think the more that Pasher is starting to play aggressively, I think he plays well with Rudy. Uh, and so there's this interesting kind of lineup considerations to be made and, it all comes down to what Tab believes, but I think Tab absolutely has confidence in Maxi Rudy to be that guy. And that's a veteran. That's a guy that can absolutely be a leader for the offense alongside Akeem Taro, a guy that other players respect around MLS, and a guy that's not going to be pushed around in MLS. He's not going to be a guy that you're going to, um, you know, that you're going to get one over on and not have it coming back. Uh, you know, he's willing to give the receipt for the, for the, for the, uh, for the knock. Um, but uh, it's interesting. I'm I'm very high on Maxi. I was when we signed him. I thought that he still had something left in the tank. I thought Montreal was not the best place for him. It wasn't the best system or st style. Um, and uh, you know, I think we're starting to see potentially here uh, that uh, Tab can be the type of coach that can get even more out of a Rudy than uh, you know he showed in in Montreal. And uh, perhaps he can be one of those dark horse kind of uh, most improved players for the season. Uh, if he has a really good season as a goal scoring, you know, center forward, that's a position that is very visible. Uh, so, you know, and so if he has a good season, he'll be high on that list. No, it says uh, it's George on the chat says he puts Ramirez in tough spot competition because Max is looking better and better, uh, and he picks him to uh, uh, to start ahead of Ramirez. Uh, but, you, man, you know, but that's the thing about competition, man. You know, obviously when Mauro got transferred, you know, we all looked at, oh, you know, does that mean Ramirez is going to get the, the, the starting spot? And I think we all kind of like maybe handed it to him you know, because he, he's, he's been here, obviously. So he has understanding of TAP's system because he played in it last year. But, you know, but obviously the reason why these, these acquisitions were made was to bring more competition to each position. TAP said, it, said so himself in all the – you know, interviews he's had with Glenn on Soccer Matters, you know, that he wants competition in every position. It's because you were, you know, my starter last season or you have 
a little bit of more knowledge in, of my system because you played last season does not mean that you will have the upper hand. It's over sh whoever shows me at this time and moment that who wants it, who can play and things like that nature and can, can do what I need them to do to make this club successful. Because at the end of the day, this club isn't successful and he's not going to be here that much longer, you know? So, uh, you know, and obviously, like I said, like I said, already actually is having an awesome preseason. I think he, I think he scored in every season game, you know, if I'm not mistaken, except maybe uh, step one, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but, you know, that's great to see. Obviously, you know, you want your number nine, you know, granted it's against USL talent, but, you know, still you want every time that ball hits the back of the net, it brings more confidence to a number nine, you know? Yeah, regardless of, regardless of the competition. So the more times he sees that ball in the back of the net, the more times he's going to be less afraid to do what he has to do to make sure that ball continues being put in the back of the net. So I'm excited. I wanna, you know, like I said, let me build on something real quick that George said in chat. He, he mentioned that Maxi got rocked in the back of the head uh, and ended up having to leave the, leave the scrimmage match. Uh, from today's open practice, it, it's important to to know that because that tells me two things. Number one, it tells me the players are going very hard in these preseason matches. They're not holding back. Um, and the other thing is they're not taking it easy. There's an understanding, at least this is what this is coming across to me. There's an understanding that they are fighting for their jobs. They are fighting for that position. Nobody's guaranteed it. Uh, and so it's good to see that. It's it, I know that sounds crazy, like, oh, God, Maxi has a potential concussion. But that is really good to see because it means Tab is really pushing these guys hard. And it also means that they're pushing themselves to get season ready real quick. Uh, and that's good. That's what we want. We want that competition level. We want that intensity. Uh, and look, you know, the players we brought in in the offseason, they're intense players. A lot of them are. They're Rudy, uh, Parker, uh, Corona. Uh, Derek Jones can be that intense when he's given the opportunity, um, you know, uh, et cetera. The list goes on. Um, you know, so it's good to kind of see that. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, yeah, that's good. That It's always good. You always want to go hard and practice, you know, and, and show out because like I said, I think the only guaranteed person to have this, their spot is Marco, Marco America, I think. And, and maybe Tim Parker. Yeah. Tim Parker. So, you know, everybody else's spot, you know, we can go down the list and be like, Oh, you know, Suren, but Corona's fighting for that spot Vera, but they brought in Jones because they wanted a bigger presence, you know, memo. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you put Darwin in, in, in that spot, you know, because you want to have Ari and Fafa as the wingers for the for whoever, whoever the number nine is, and you know, and somebody gets moved. So, depending on what you know formation and what kind of style of play and who shows going out, you know, there's going to be competition for every spot and every slot, and that's what you want. Not only because you want to make everybody else better, the fact of the matter is that you're going to have games coming quickly. And like I said, if, if the Dynamo do well and qualify for Open Cup play and other and for other whatever games that pop up um you want to be able to have the depth to when you substitute when you take out a player you put somebody else in the the rhythm doesn't stop and the and and the attacking proudness and and the and the system continues to keep going full speed without any hesitation so yeah i want to piggyback yeah. on that too because you just mentioned uh u.s open cup um and uh somebody and i don't ask me who it was who did the research but somebody and i thought i want to say it was a ta member uh in the the ta uh facebook uh it was brought up about us open cup and somebody asked well what's it going to take to actually qualify um you know historically speaking um and uh, they went back and looked at last year's and, and i think since like 2015 and uh the top eight slots have gone to teams that have had either five points or better and usually if you have five points you're you're basically in a three or four way tie for the eighth slot. So, you know, three, three matches we have to, you know, realistically we need to win one and draw two to have a chance. And then we really need to win two out of the three, yeah. uh, you know, to, to almost pretty much guarantee ourselves ourselves a slot. Well, our three matches are, uh, here at home, um, against San Jose away at Portland. And then here at home against, uh, LAFC, uh, by no means is as is that an easy first three matches. Um, you know, San Jose is probably the easiest of those three teams, but not by, not by much. Um, all three of them are very talented teams, uh, especially LAFC, especially Portland. You know, yeah, you know, but historically like, Portland on the road has not been favorable to us, except for the Morrow uh, playoff victory. But that's beside the point. I mean, but you know, but but we have to kind of shed that stigma. You know, especially if we're trying to turn the page and. 
and become become a, a winning and, and become a winning club and have a winning culture. So we need to stop worrying about you know looking at the looking at the the schedule and be like, oh man, we got we got LAFC, we got Portland, oh we got Atlanta United. You know, when we see these big clubs, we start like to you know lining up or stiffing up. Like, nah, man, if, if this is going to be a real big change in culture and become a winning culture, and we want to really shoot for the stars and be one of those top clubs in this league. We have to act like it. We have to go out there and play our game. You know, we have to go out there when we're on the road and make sure that we go out there and we go for wins. We're not just playing for the draw. Um, you know, that's that's what these top clubs do. You know, LAFC plays like LAFC, regardless if they play in Bank of uh, their Bank of uh, California Stadium or if they play in, in um, Miami or if they're playing in D.C. United or if they're playing here in Houston. They play the same way. They have no fear. They go out there. They're trying to win. They're trying to get three points. There's no, hey, we're gonna go and try to try to get a, a road point, you know, because it's gonna look it looks good because we're 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 getting points on the road. No, getting points on the road is three points. You know, uh, yeah, obviously you don't want to lose the game, I and mean, if you can get a tie, great. But I mean, but this particular thing that you know, obviously we have to be one of the top eight clubs, you know, points wise to qualify for this U.S. Open spot. U.S. Open Cup spot, we have to be aggressive, especially those first three games. You know, the first three games, everybody's still shaking off the cobwebs. They're not fully fit, so LAFC is not the LAFC. You know, that's gonna, that they're gonna, probably going to be, you know, midseason dominating or whatever. Uh, Portland's still the same thing as the same thing with them. San Jose, the same thing with them as well. Uh, so I feel like, hey. We have a rich shot these three clubs to really gain some points and really show out and qualify for the US Open Cup competition. Because let's, let's face it, man, we need to have uh, different goals for the season. Now, obviously, the main goal is to reach the playoffs for MLS. I think a, a, a foreseeable goal, which is a more uh, more uh, a goal for, for right now, is to qualify for the Open Cup. And then once you do that, you know, maybe even go after winning the Open Cup. To qualify for a CCL spot, you know, so it's not. Is there these? These are not goals that are just hard and far fetched that we, we as a Dynamo can can achieve. You know, especially we're trying to go into this winning culture that we so that we speak so much about. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can't hear you, Sean. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on. If I, Sean's on mute. <laughs> oh, Mark, we try to figure out what's going on with Sean's uh, mic. <laughs> yeah, well, we try to figure that out. I don't know what's going on over there, but uh, but yeah, man. Before we go, move on to the last topic. You know, we want to. I want to talk about a little bit about the fan fest, man, that we had this past weekend on Saturday. You know. I know uh, I got to meet a couple of you guys out there. Um, there you go, Sean. What's going on? I was just saying uh, enough about open. Uh, why don't you talk about the thing that you want to talk about, which you already started talking about? So go for it. Yeah, yeah. So you know, obviously, uh, a bunch of us. I've got to meet a bunch of people from the surge. You know, uh, other guys and things of that nature. Um, you know, shout out to uh, Amy, Oelia, uh Jeff, Sergio, uh, Ryan, you know, everybody out there who was out there at Pitch 25 and at the fire cell, uh, Nestor, AJ, obviously, um, you know, a great time, you know, good to have a couple of drinks with you guys. And there goes Mark again. <laughs> it's that kind of night, guys. That kind of night. I was not at Fan Fest because I had to work. I was on call this weekend. Uh, unfortunately, so I didn't get to go, but, uh, I've heard stories, uh, I've seen pictures, I've seen videos, I am extremely jealous, uh, and that fire sale looked, uh, well, it looked fire, uh, it looked impressive, uh, and I know a lot of people got some really good stuff from that fire sale, so, uh, I am the jealous, uh, for sure. Uh, with that being said, if Mark isn't back yet, you're breaking up so bad we can't even hear you, bro. You might as well disconnect and reconnect. That's twice. That's not actually happened where Mark's dropped out twice in a, in a show. That's kind of crazy. And it's only a one-hour show tonight, too. 
He's gonna he's gonna have to get that uh get the high speed uh, internet going on at at his house so we can uh, we can have a full show because once the uh, season starts we might be going back to two hours guys sometimes three. Uh, anyways, uh, enough silence for the show. Uh, so uh, fan fest, you know, Mark talked about it. Uh, there was one other thing I wanted to bring up that's on my list. Uh, <laughs> he spent all that money on fire sale and he forgot to pay Comcast. No, uh, man, I don't give a fuck Comcast. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm talk sorry. Talk about that name. fire sale. Talk about that fire sale. Man, um, yeah, dudes, I mean, it's just one of those things where, I don't know, ever since the ice storm, my kind of kind of my internet starts kind of kind of messing up, so... I'm gonna have to talk to AT and C for a little bit, but yeah, going back to the fire sale, man. You know, it was a great show out. Um, happy to meet a lot of you guys, just see some of the guys that I met for the first time. Georgie, what's up, man? You know, it was good to see you again too. But um, and you know, it was just a great time, man. I can't wait to do it again. You know, I'll, apparently there's gonna be another final final f uh, fire sale. Um, we'll see what happens with that. I need to go get me a dynamo chair. Apparently. Uh, yeah, uh, man, see, the thing is, is I can't even get Comcast where I'm at. Trust me, I had it at my old apartment and it was far superior to what I've got with UVerse here. If I could have you, if I could have Comcast Xfinity, I would completely have it here. And yeah, you're not wrong. The prices are significantly cheaper for the same speed. Uh, completely, completely terrible. Uh, yeah, Nestor, I, Nestor's. Yeah, so Comcast, if you're watching and you want to sponsor us, uh, first thing you got to do is you got to fix uh, Nestor's uh, internet in order that our broadcaster and uh, producer can have internet that actually allows the stream to stay up the entire show, especially when we start hitting those two to three hour shows in the season. Uh, yeah, that'd be great. So if, you, if you're watching Comcast, which you know, if you are, hey, first of all, thanks for watching. Second of all, fix this freaking internet, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, welcome we're, back, we're Mark, for the third time. We're, we're on preseason mode. Yeah. <laughs> so is your AT and T apparently? Oh man, dude! I'm telling you, ever since the ice storm, dude, like it, like my Wi-Fi and everything has been so so crap. Um, gonna have you gotta nice get them. You gotta get them to come out and take a look at your outside line. Sounds like you got an outside line issue. Yeah, I'm gonna have a nice little chat with those guys tomorrow when I call them up. So. Uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, fire sale. Like I said, I, as I saw on Twitter and Facebook and Discord and everywhere else, every, you know, it was fantastic and. Uh, getting everybody getting together again was fantastic, and like I said, highly jealous that I couldn't make it out there. Uh, I'll be out there at some point this season for for some festivities, but things are just crazy with work stuff and uh, allergies. Screw them, they suck. Uh, with that said, uh, let's move on to the final topic of the night. We got 13 minutes. I don't even know if we're going to go 13 minutes on this topic, but that's all right. Uh, so there's a uh, a conversation going on, and obviously there's a lawsuit out there uh, where the U.S. Women's National Team players are suing U.S. Uh, Soccer Federation uh, over the um, existing CBA uh, collective bargaining agreement. And uh, Megan Rapino is kind of the one leading that charge, uh, publicly speaking. Uh, and uh, I don't know what day this was. Uh, yesterday, actually. Uh, there was a uh, there were some comments that Hope Solo made um, uh, Ho Ho that Hope Solo made uh, towards uh, Megan Rapino and specifically about Megan Rapino and they're not they're not the level that maybe you expect but there's still there's still a, a hint of uh, a hint of a slight at Megan Rapino and the comments are exactly. Uh, Solo told it, and this was to be in sports, Megan led the team into signing a less than equal collective bargaining agreement. We were so close to achieving equal pay in 2016. It was even offered to us. We were about to sign the contract with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. But Megan Rapino and the leaders of that team signed a less than equal CBA, which is concerning for the overall current class action uh, lawsuit and the overall fight. Uh, and she said some stuff after that, um, talking about it, but what's important from those comments is her talking and her saying, um, that they were offered equal pay in 2016. And if that's true, um, and the, the team or their representatives basically agreed, the players, uh, representatives basically agreed, um, to not, uh, take the equal pay at that time. 
um, then their argument right now in the lawsuit uh, is that um, it's pretty null and void. You know, hey, you were offered it four years ago. You were offered it in 2016, and you didn't take it. Um, you know, that, that gives them pretty flimsy footing to stand on. And it also shines a light on Megan Rapinoe um, <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. But specifically, if Hope Solo is saying that, uh, you know, Megan Rapino and the leaders of that team, specifically pointing out and, and, and pointing to Megan Rapino as one of those leaders of that team, were the ones that, that basically encouraged the team to sign or the players to sign the less than equal CBA. Um, you have to wonder if there's more to that story than that. And I guarantee you there is. But when I say that, I'm referring to were those players given some sort of, you know, assurances or, um, you know, uh, representation of, of, you know, future sponsorship opportunities, um, you know, appearances, um, you know, special uh, exclusions from certain terms, et cetera, uh, in order to sweeten the deal for them, in order to get them to encourage their teammates that, um, you know, were the, the younger teammates of theirs that looked up to them. Uh, to get them to agree. In other words, what I'm saying is, did U.S. soccer leverage these veteran players that were considered team leaders of that of that U.S. women's national team in 2016? Did they leverage their profiles, um, you know, by sweetening the deal for them in order to get the younger players to sign off and agree to a less than stellar deal? And, and if it comes that, out, if it comes out that that was the case, it completely shatters every bit of what they've been arguing about and arguing for. You know, uh, it sounds like they they kind of they went they went straight to the top um, when it came to this uh, agreement. You know, for them to sign back in 2016, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, to hey, come on, let's 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 we got this coming up. We got the World Cup coming up, the Olympics, things of that nature. So come on, let, let's uh, let's go talk to Megan and I guess I guess at that time Abby and maybe Carly were the were the, were the top three known uh, players at that moment or the leaders, quote unquote leaders of that, of that soccer uh, team for that year. Um, and said to these girls, these gals like, Hey man, you know, we got this coming up. We want to, we want to take care of y'all, but you know, we got Olympics and world cup coming up, you know, um, let's get something done. And then we'll revisit it after, you know, the cycle is over. And, you know, obviously the cycle has been oh, it's, it's gone, you know, and, and and the way and the way it's being, I guess, portrayed because, like I said, the way I'm seeing it is that they kind of, you know, swing the deal for the leaders of that squad at that moment for that particular time. And so that way, whatever they said, they knew that the younger players were going to go with whatever they said, you know, because, you know, obviously exactly. the team leaders and you expect them to lead your team, you know, to whatever whatever is best beneficial for the whole squad, right? Um, you know, so we'll, 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 we'll see what comes out of that, man. But let me ask you a question, man. Obviously, you know, the whole big issue about this is the fair pay, the fair pay you know, equal pay rights for the for the women and everything. And, and trust me, look, I'm, I'm, I'm for equal pay for the women, you know, especially in the U.S. Soccer Federation with as much success as the women have had, you know, uh, in soccer as opposed to the men where they just failed to qualify for the Olympics again. And they did, and they, and they failed to qualify for the last, last, uh, last time's world cup, uh, the 2018 world cup. So obviously the women have a lot of leverage on that standpoint, as far as success and, and being a marketable team and have marketable, marketable players. So I'm, I'm, I'm a thousand hundred trillion billion percent on four for them to get equal pay from the Federation. Right, as far as from the players, uh, as the player standpoint goes, what do you think about afterwards? But but like on the other side with the sponsorships, you know, um, obviously we know that the sponsorships focus more on the men's side of the of, of the of the game more than they do the the women's side, right? Obviously, there's a lot of companies that picked up on the women's side of the of the things like Budweiser, uh, uh, American Express, things of that nature. But but let's not kid ourselves. The sponsorship dollars are still going to the men's side. It's probably about 10, 15 times more than what they're giving to the women's side still at this at, at this year. Um, what do you think about, you know, as far as like the other side of the payment? From the Federation standpoint, each player, women, men should be paid the same. But then when you start talking about sponsorship and, and things of that nature and, and bonuses given out because of 
you know, whatever happens. You know, it's it, it's highly it's highly noted that the winner of the world of the women's World Cup makes on par about the same same amount as uh, a men's team that qualifies for the knockout stages in the World Cup, which means you know you're one of the top 16 teams and 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 the men's team. You know, that's the same equal payment as the winner of the women's World Cup, and that's because of sponsorship money. You know, this this be real. Um, what do you so when they bring up that argument, how do you how do you com- combat that and tell tell somebody that you know, hey, I'm gonna pay you the same as the men, but yeah, I know I don't make the I don't I don't bring as much money on this side of the game as I do this this side of the game. Well, let, let's back up for a moment because I think what gets lost in this conversation is that in in the 2017 CBA, which came as a result of that 2016 conversations or those discussions. Um, that that CBA uh, basically is structured completely different than the one that the men's side uh, has. And it's not a negative difference. It's just it is a difference. Um, and, and that makes it difficult to truly nail down what is this whole concept of equal pay. Because the we have to remember, the U.S. women's national team players are actually salaried employees of U.S. soccer where they actually get their guaranteed annual wage and benefits from U.S. soccer. With the men's national team, it's completely different because they're paid mostly in just roster and performance-related bonuses. They're not paid by U.S. soccer as salaried employees because they are salaried employees of their respective clubs worldwide. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the U.S. women's national team players are so... Uh, it's a completely different structure. They're paid by the federation as salaried players, so that they have, so that they can basically attend their opportunities throughout the season. Um, and then NWSL is basically supplemented by the U.S. Uh, U.S. Soccer uh, Federation uh, by bre- letting those players play in the league, basically bringing those players into their league. Uh, U.S. Men's National Team is a completely different situation. Because those players are paid by their club or MLS as, as the situation is, not by U.S. soccer in terms of salary. They're just given performance bonuses or, you know, uh, in terms of appearance bonuses, if you will. If the women want equal pay, they need to get away from U.S. from being salaried employees of U.S. soccer. They need to get their salaries from their teams, their clubs or their leagues, not from U.S. soccer. Otherwise, it's never going to be an equal pay situation. Um, but, and so this concept of equal pay to me is a little bit confusing for that reason. Now, I want them to get equal pay, but I also want them to understand when you agree to equal pay, you agree to equal considerations along both sides. That means the consequences for not meeting whatever the restrictions or requirements are, are the same. That means that you need to structure things the same way because it doesn't come out the same way. Now, to your point, talking about the Women's World Cup and the Men's World Cup, that's not decided by U.S. soccer. That's decided by FIFA. Mm-hmm. FIFA has a tremendous issue um, with you know equal, not just equal pay, but equal opportunities for, for the women's uh, players versus the men's players. And we can even extend that to beyond FIFA, just the sports world in general. We saw that just just recently, right now, currently going on with the NCAA men's and women's tournaments. The women's weight room is a single room that's no more than like a 20-foot by 20-foot room, whereas the men's is like a 150-foot by 150-foot room full of all sorts of weights and stuff. You know, it's, it's crazy different. But why? Because it really shouldn't be that way because they're in the exact same place they should be able to split that up a little bit more more equally, but it just highlights the whole point of, you know, equal play, equal pay. And again, if, if the U S women's national team truly want equal pay, they have to understand that it means equal play. Um, Yes, they are far better than the U S men's national team. And I won't argue that, but that also means they're, they would have to agree to structure their contracts and structure the way that they're paid the same way that the men are paid. Go ahead. Yeah, and before, and before we go, because I know we're, we're pushing up against uh, 830 here. Um, they go to that, Sean. I mean, obviously, you see, let's take the Dash, for example. The Dash is probably like a, a fifth, a, a tenth of the payroll of the Dynamo, to be honest, you know? You know, so you're you're talking about paying players from the club, you know, and they're making, oh, man, I don't even want to, uh, maybe 40, 50,000 a year for, for a regular player. 
you know, that, that's not that's not that's not your your Jane Campbells or your Mewes or your Rachel Daly's who, you know, like I said, you know, get a little bit of a, a sponsorship deals here and there or whatever. But uh, but that's not it might it might be good for the for the top echelon of women players. But but for the rest of the women's players, it might not be such a great goal for them. That's I think that's where they kind of they can lose their leverage from breaking in from within, you know, Um I don't know. It's it, it's hard, man, because you know, obviously, I would love I would love to see a day where you know, with the the women's side of, of sports, any sports, not just soccer, basketball, it could be basketball, you know, whatever, and see the same amount of revenue that the men's do. But it's just that's not the that's not the point. That's not the, that's not the case right now. And you know, it sucks. You know, don't get me wrong, it sucks. Uh, agreed, and I think that's probably the perfect way to end uh, tonight's show. Um, you know, again, it, neither of us are against the idea of equal pay. I, I just think that there are considerations that need to be made, and it's not a knock on the women's national team or the women's national team players. Uh, it's just how things are structured currently, uh, and it's a very different environment currently. I would love to see that change. I would love to see NWSL have the capability to pour money, more money into their teams and the owners of these teams to pour mo- more money into their clubs. The women's players can be paid on par with the men's players, um, but you know we're still a ways off from that. I, you know, realistically, we're still a, a considerable ways off from that. But it is improving, just not enough uh, currently. But uh, yeah, Mark, you want to close this out, buddy? Yeah, guys, thank you very much for joining us on this week. You know, I know we had a little bit of technical difficulty, especially from my end. I know Sean lost a little bit of his voice out there, uh, but uh, man, you know, thank you for joining us each and every time we get on here. Uh, we're looking forward to next week. Hopefully, if not, then, you know, the next time we do get on. Uh, guys, you know, please, you know, if you haven't got, you know, back to our Twitch channel, uh, follow me at, at Chesterovia. Follow Sean at Sean Ringwells on Twitter. Um, at Jen Orange Radio on Twitter. Well, you know, anything you want to ask us, we comment as quickly as possibly we can. And, you know, remember to always hold it down. <laughs>